It's the 21st century. Following the events of what would one day come to be known as the Great War, the Earth government establishes the Earth Directorate, which seeks to arbitrate international and intercorporate disputes. Around the same time, scientists and astrophysicists develop the skip drive, which, for the first time in history, allows for intergalactic travel at speeds faster than the speed of light. The space exploration industry explodes, and countless corporations take to the stars in search of financial opportunity. The Earth Directorate, which is very much at the forefront of the movement, begins auctioning off habitable star systems. Roughly 200 years later, ten powerful corporations come together to form the Halcyon Holdings Corporation, or HHC, with the sole purpose of pooling their resources and purchasing the rights to the remote Halcyon system. Not long after, HHC begins a decade-long journey aboard their first colony ship, the Groundbreaker, en route to Halcyon. Upon their arrival, the colonists attempt to terraform the moon Terra-1, but severely damage the planet's ecosystem in the process, ultimately making the planet extremely dangerous and uninhabitable. Realizing that their first attempt at colonization was a failure, HHC moves on to Terra-2 and successfully terraforms much of the planet. Eventually, one of the ten corporations that make up HHC would go on to take advantage of a legal loophole and claim Terra-1, later referred to as Monarch, for themselves, rebranding themselves as Monarch Stellar Industries. Infuriated by this move, the board would eventually retaliate through the implementation of the Hazard Clause, which forced all corporations to abandon the planet and effectively placed it under indefinite embargo. In 2285, a second colony ship departs Earth for Halcyon, carrying with it hundreds of thousands of passengers. Most of these passengers are placed into stasis for the decade-long journey, while a small crew of 24 are left awake to pilot the ship. Nine years later, in 2294, the Hope's skip drive malfunctions, rendering the ship incapable of traveling at faster-than-light speeds. This extends the remaining travel time to Halcyon by 25 years, meaning that instead of reaching their destination in 2295, the colonists were to arrive in 2320. With only enough rations to feed the crew of 24 for one more year, the threat of starvation suddenly becomes reality. Panic sets in and tensions rise. The captain's wife, Donna Hunt, attempts to grow tomatoes aboard the ship to feed the crew, but is unsuccessful. Realizing that time is running out, the ship's chief engineer, Frank Nalda, begins bringing colonists out of stasis as a source of food for himself and the crew. Captain Hunt is kept in the dark about this until Frank eventually confesses the truth, hoping that the captain would support his plan to cannibalize the remaining colonists. Hunt, however, is left horrified by the revelation, and decides to lock Frank in the ship's brig for his crimes. Sadly, this hardly solves the problem. Several other crew members are also supportive of Frank's idea to cannibalize the colonists. One of these crew members is the ship's medical officer, Alexei Volkov, who attempts to convince the captain that the plan is a rational one. It's calculated that, in order to survive the 26 years it would take to reach Halcyon, the crew would need to eat tens of thousands of colonists. Starvation worsens, and so too does the dysfunction aboard the Hope. Frank Nolda is freed from the brig. Later, Frank tries to convince the captain's own wife, Donna, to support his plan by offering her a piece of human flesh, which she even admits is delicious. However, Donna is determined not to become a cannibal like the others, and, rather than being forced to choose between starvation and cannibalism, she decides to take her own life. Following the death of Donna Hunt, the crew begins to openly rebel against the captain, who immediately locks down parts of the ship and seals off access to the hibernation storage bays. He then locks himself and his navigator, Rezi Torrega, inside the ship's bridge for their own safety. But Frank and his supporters are relentless. 
They use drills to open the sealed door to the hibernation storage bays, prompting Captain Hunt to leave the safety of the bridge and confront Frank once and for all. To this day, it is not known exactly what happened during that confrontation, but in one way or another, the entire crew ended up dying, leaving the passengers trapped in stasis aboard the now unmanned colony ship. 26 years later, the Hope arrives in Halcyon. The Halcyon Holdings Corporate Board discovers the ship, but by this point, the passengers have already spent too much time in stasis and can no longer be revived. Not wanting to draw the public's attention, HHC quietly moves the Hope into orbit around the ice planet known as Typhon, their intent being to abandon the colony ship entirely. It's around this time that a scientist working for the board by the name of Phineas Wells learns the true fate of the Hope. Contrary to the views of his colleagues, Wells is convinced that the colonists could still be revived through research and experimentation. After his superiors deny him permission to commence research on long-term hibernation revival, Wells begins researching on his own, secretly removing hibernating colonists from the Hope and transporting them to his hidden lab. For the next 35 years, Wells, now a branded criminal, conducts countless experiments in hopes of one day discovering the secret to reviving the colonists. After extensive trial and error, he learns that flash-frozen organic material reverts back to its original cell structure when treated with a tincture of dimethyl sulfoxide. The bad news, he admits, is that this compound is difficult to acquire due to the fact that it exists in extremely limited quantities. Finally, in May of 2355, Phineas Wells has another breakthrough. After recovering a colonist from the Hope, Wells is able to use his chemical formula to bring him out of hibernation. Wells is ecstatic. After decades of intense research and experimentation, he has finally awoken one of the passengers aboard the Hope, a passenger that had been asleep for 70 years and was considered dead. But his work isn't done just yet. If Phineas is to revive the remaining colonists, then he will need more chemicals. The board discovers his location and quickly moves in. With time running out, Wells makes a snap decision and sends the revived colonist to Terra 2. And this is where the game officially begins. So there you have it, folks. The full prequel to The Outer Worlds, leading all the way up to the very first scene in the game. I had a great time gathering research for this video, and it was made that much more enjoyable thanks to Obsidian's superb storytelling ability. But what do you think? Do you find the prequel to The Outer Worlds interesting? What events or time periods would you like to learn more about? Let me know in the comments below. I post new videos on The Outer Worlds every Wednesday and Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, so be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification icon so that you can be alerted when I post new content. If you're so inclined, leave a like on this video too. I'd really appreciate it. I'll be back in just a few days with a brand new video on The Outer Worlds, but that's all I've got for now. Thank you again so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.